What the heck is going on? What the, what the hell? Hey guys, what you see in front of you here are two of these very strange looking Philips LED light bulbs. You may never have actually seen one of these before, but the very early era of consumer LED bulbs, these were pretty common, say, in home improvement stores. I don't think they gained a lot of popularity though because they were $25 each if I recall. But this was sort of Philips' first good quality consumer grade LED bulb. And things have changed a lot in the time since then. We have the whole era of $1 bulbs. You can check out my other videos on that if you're interested in seeing a teardown of those. Now I found these bulbs in the e-waste bin and I'm not sure why they were in there. I gave them a try and they seem to work fine but maybe they have some intermittent faults. Now first off one thing you notice when you pick these up is they are really heavy. This is a metal heat sink and as you can see it kind of extends up into this top part. That part's plastic. This is plastic but this is all metal so clearly they were concerned about heat generation on these. Now if we look up close this is an 800 lumen bulb. Dimmable. 12.5 watts at 2700K. These are not multi-voltage bulbs. Now look at these with this weird yellow color on this outside part, you'd almost feel like there's just no way that these can produce an actual white color light, right? Actually, you'd be wrong. It produces a really nice approximation of incandescent bulbs. There's none of that telltale 60 hertz flicker, so clearly there's good capacitance in here. And the only issue that might be is probably the uniformity, because as you see when I turn it, there's a dark spot there. But this isn't going to be a teardown. I wanted to show you something that's very different about these. So this bulb here, I've already removed this top plastic piece. And once you do that, you can take these off. Uh, look at that, a little breakage going on there. I'll talk about that in a sec. The covers or globes came right off. And what's happening here is this plastic underneath was probably some type of a diffuser or a light diffuser. I guess over time, since this bulb runs really warm, these have just dried and gotten brittle. Now with the globes off, when we take a quick look at the construction here, you'll see a circuit board, probably ceramic, with three LED chips, and it's attached to a thermal pad there, which obviously conducts the heat from this board into the metal heat sink here. On the top, there's a little circuit board with three connectors on it, which is where these plug in. So this is clearly an expensive LED bulb. I mean, look at the construction quality. It's nothing like the cheap ones we have today. But there's something else that's really weird about this. Watch when I power this up, what happens? The light that this is putting out is an extremely bright blue light. And these covers, when you cover this, actually change the blue light into white light. What this is called is remote phosphor. So essentially a white LED is typically actually a blue LED, just like these ones here. And then there's a phosphor that emits the white light painted on top of the LED chip. And if you ever look at a white, a warm white LED chip, you'll notice that they're kind of a yellowy color when they're turned off. But when you turn it on, they will glow white. And there are different phosphor colors for different color temperatures. I'll link to an interesting study by Cree, which just shows that remote phosphor LEDs like this are actually more efficient. Okay, let's do a quick test to see what voltage these chips are running at. Sorry, I don't have the LED light in the frame. It washes out the camera. Okay, 8.47 volts per board. And each of these boards obviously has three chips on it. So 8.47 and we got three. 2.82 volts per LED. That's not bad. It's definitely not overdriving them. If I disconnect one of these boards, we'll be able to tell if it's running them in series or in parallel with each other. Oh boy, everything is breaking. Okay, well, that connector just disintegrated and broke. I can't, <laughs> I can't get that off. So I guess this bulb is probably not gonna work anymore or it may work, let's see. Yeah, it doesn't work anymore. So now that this doesn't work, this is obviously running the boards in series. That means we're running the power supply at about 25 volts for this entire assembly here. So I got the wires back on. I just, the connector's broken, but it had the little metal uh, clip still. So I just pushed the wires back onto the terminals. And yep, the light's working again. So this is where I'm intrigued by these bulbs. If you look at my little screwdriver thing here, this is fluorescing extremely brightly. So looking online, it seems that these remote phosphor LED bulbs always use royal blue LEDs, which is 457 nanometers. 
And very interesting is that color blue really makes things fluoresce. And I shine this around my basement and anything else that might fluoresce under a black light also glows really brightly. So that got me thinking, could I use these for retro bright? Now I've talked before about the fact that where I live in Portland, Oregon, there's just not a lot of sunlight in the winter. But we're nearly in autumn right now and essentially the sun's going to be gone for the next several months. So any kind of retro brighting will have to be done indoors. I've had people suggest to me that I could use black lights, I could use UV lights, I could use all sorts of different things. But I don't have a black light and I don't have any UV lights and all of that stuff would cost money. But these blue lights with these covers removed of course, these, if these work, this might be a good solution. And especially for this reason. I have quite a few of these. I found a good number. I think I found eight. So if these all work properly and with the covers removed, I could easily build a box with some really inexpensive light sockets, put tin foil around the inside and just make a really insanely bright blue box. Okay, so I need to know if this works. So let's test this. I'm going to show you my test setup right now. Okay, so at the start of the video, you saw this blue glow coming from over here. So what you can imagine now is that I have a little thing set up here with something actually being retro brighter right now. So let me unplug the lamp first. I have an Amiga mouse wrapped in plastic wrap and I have the cream, the volume 40 cream under there. And I took a little box and I put some aluminum foil in there, which just will hopefully direct any extra light onto the sides. Now I found that the bulb runs very, very hot. And of course in here, it's not really getting a lot of airflow because this thing is designed for incandescent bulbs. So I set up a little 12 volt fan and I'm blowing air into there. But this Amiga mouse has already been in here for I'd say a couple hours. And here's a before shot that I took. And as you can see, it was really yellow. And I really think this is already working pretty well actually. There appears to be a huge improvement. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this back in here, but let me talk about something while I'm showing you this. So you can't see in the camera at all because it's completely washed out. But originally, when I put this under here, the parts of the mouse that were actually quite yellowed were showing up as sort of a reddish color under the blue light. And I can still see some of that. And I know you see some in the camera there, but that's not, that's not what we're seeing. I see red up here and up here now. I don't see any on this middle section. Originally when I put it in, there was a lot of red. If I flipped it over to the part that wasn't yellow, there was no red color. So it's almost like the UV damage shows up as sort of a reddish color under this blue light. So I don't really know if that means anything, but at least it helps me know if this thing is de-yellowing because as the yellow goes away, the red fades and it's definitely doing that now. It's fading. So I'll probably check on this a few more times before I go to bed. It's around 8.45 right now. And then uh, I'll leave it overnight and we'll see how it looks in the morning. Well, it's the next day. We're, it's in the morning, so I'd say it's about 12 hours. Uh, let's give these a wash and see how they look. I hope they're not damaged. Maybe I left it in too long. I don't know. Let's take a quick look at the stuff out of the blue light so you can actually see it. So on the bottom plate here, we had yellowing along the top edge here. And I think it was either on this side. Oh, it's, it was on this side. I could still see some yellowing there. So I had this sort of propped up like this all night where the light was shining down the top. And it wasn't really shining on the side here. So the rest of the bottom was actually completely fine. And on the other part, I had rotated this around several times and tilted it up down in every other which way. But absolutely just looking through this plastic through this plastic wrap, this looks amazing. Alright, so yeah, I just dried these off. I stuck them on a paper towel here and I liberally sprayed them with this 303 UV protectant. My friend who's a car detailer swears by this stuff and I apply it post retrobrite to all of my plastics. But I have a feeling, and this is not scientific, this is just anecdotal, that applying this may help plastics from re-yellowing. I have a couple things I retrobrited over a year ago. They were very yellow. I have applied this post retrobrite and none of, neither of them have re-yellowed. Here are two Apple extended keyboard twos. 
they were both very yellowed because you know apple's abs plastic and the space bar here very much yellow not the pbt keys but what i do is when i clean these i retrobrighted the case and the keyboard and then i applied 303 very liberally to everything including the pbt keys so i hope that that keeps these keyboards nice and fresh looking for the rest of their lives or at least a long time but I'll just let this sit for a while, maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then I'll use a rag to wipe it and buff it down, and then I'll reassemble the mouse and we'll take a look. So here's the finished product, and I have to say this looks fantastic. It's probably just slightly yellow versus how it was when it was brand new, but this mouse looked like crap and it was horribly yellowed when I got it. I'd say this looks great. I also cleaned up the cord, it just made it look nice in general. But yeah, can you retrobrite under blue LED light? The answer, at least in this case, was yes. People are saying you need ozone or you need heat or you need UV. Well, 457 nanometers, which is the royal blue LEDs used in this, is not UV. And yet, it absolutely retrobrited this mouse perfectly. But anyhow, I will do further experiments and probably create another video to update you guys. But if you found this interesting or have any questions or comments, uh, you know you know what to do. Put them in the comment section below. You can subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching. Bye.